Good morning. I'm Christian Holmes. I work at the U.S. Agency for International Development as its Global Water Coordinator, and I'd like to welcome you here today. I'd like to talk to you today about a great adventure which USAID, the government of Sweden, and the government of Netherlands have launched to make a demonstrable difference in the lives of millions of people who face the plight of the individual here on the screen encountering dire conditions, little water, and trying to produce food in that kind of environment. And I'd also like to propose perhaps a little bit of a shift in thinking. You know, we are very accustomed to hearing about points of no return as it, as it relates to tremendous climatic changes increasingly providing threats to our environment and our society. But there are also individuals on the ground that seemingly may face a point of no return, such as this farmer who clearly has inadequate soil and water which to grow crops, and provide this farmer and millions like this farmer with points of return, places in which and ways in which individuals like this can in fact prosper, sustain themselves, lift themselves out of poverty, all because of innovative ways in which to provide additional water to produce food. And in my presentation today, I'd like to cover four very innovative ways that we are supporting through this partnership. And I hope you'll think of them as points of return. The challenge that we face is enormous, and I even hesitate to go through statistics, but it's worth considering that between now and the year 2050, our world's population will increase from 7 billion to 9 billion. At the same time, a population that already uses 70% of the water on the planet for food production will find itself in need globally of 55% more water, and at the same time, between now and 2050, the world will have to meet, will have to produce 55% more food in order to meet the needs of this ever-increasing population. So when USAID and its colleagues from Sweden and the Netherlands came together to try to address this problem develop new ways in which to provide innovative solutions. We thought, you know, not only are we asking for innovations, we better seek these innovations in a very clever, innovative fashion. And what we did is we agreed that, first of all, we would be very clear as to what we felt would be the key problems impeding increasing water for food. And those three problems are water reuse, water capture and storage, and salinity. Secondly, we decided that we were not going to provide solutions to the world and say comment upon them, as might be the case in a normal request for proposals. But rather, we would just lay these problems out to the world and say, if you have a proven technology or a technology that's on the cusp of working, then we hope that you will submit that to us because we would like to provide and partner with you financial support as an inducement to help you take that technology from a place that it works to another part of the world. And we issued this challenge, and in return, some 520 applicants from 90 countries around the world came in and they said, we think these solutions can work. We winnowed them down to some 17 finalists. We're now in the process of concluding these agreements, and I want to share with you the work of four of the finalists. In a turn, we'll be making awards between $300,000 to $1 million to each of these uh, finalists in order to facilitate the transfer of their technology into the developing world. So I mentioned to you, and I used the word adventure at the beginning of this presentation, and it really is the process of going out on our entire planet and trying to bring forth great solutions to these pressing problems. And to begin with the first one of the adventures, the story begins in the Yellowstone. And this is the famous geyser in the Yellowstone. And a discovery was made here, which I think and others think is going to be critical towards increasing food production in harsh conditions. About 20 years ago, a team of geologists went to the Yellowstone to basically explore what kind of life might be able to list in proximity of these geysers where temperature rises up to 161 degrees and where the ecology had actually had been classified officially as being sterile. And when they got there, they noticed little clumps of grass, a species called panic grass, and they posed the question, 
Why is it alive? In an analyzing of the grass, they discovered that on the root system of the grass, there was a little colony of microfungal organisms. And in further analyzing this, they discovered that the fungal organisms in the plant itself had a symbiotic relationship. Namely, the plant without the fungal organisms could not survive at severe temperatures, up to 141 degrees Fahrenheit. And likewise, the fungus couldn't survive without the plant. So they took this technology, namely the fungal growth, and they've applied it to other crops, in this case corn. On the right, rather on the left over here, is corn over an 18-day uh, period that is grown without water. And as you can see, by the 18th day, it's dead. Here is corn that's been treated with this fungal organism that's been able to maintain its facility and, and life over an 18-day period. So right now in the United States, in more than 10 states, there are field trials underway in order to be able to test the application um, of this product as it applies to both corn and rice. Uh, this is in Michigan. And soon, this firm, once the technology has been approved here in the States, plan to transfer it overseas, and the expectation is it will be transferred first to India, where a partner has been identified. Let me turn to another country uh, and another adventure that's going on. This is the Texel Island in the Netherlands. Uh, and one of the great challenges that we face you know, on our planet is that there are 1,000 million hectares of saline soil on our planet. And desertification is increasing, and so is the salinity of soil and water. So the challenge is, how do you enable people to grow crops in highly saline water, when in the past they've only been able to grow those crops in fresh water? So in this project, a company called Texel has been supporting an initiative called salt farming. And what they've done, essentially, is develop a potato and the potato is not grown in fresh water. In fact, the potato is grown in water that has a salinity concentration of 20%. They successfully grown the product. It's non-GMO. It's a potato strain. And they've marketed the product within the Netherlands. And they now plan to take that product with a Pakistani partner and transfer it to the potato belt in Pakistan, where there are literally millions of acres that are under pressure from high levels of salinity. The Dutch have also been extremely effective in looking at salt tolerant crops in a wide variety of areas. What you're looking at right now is quinoa, the grain that's extremely high in protein content. And the Dutch basically have taken this quinoa, which has a resistance to almost 50% for growing quinoa in salinity levels as high as 50% saline. And they've been able to grow a strain that will essentially facilitate its adaptation to other parts of the world. Because this crop, quinoa, grown on its own, has a very hard uh, hull around the crop itself, and it has to be milled. And in some places, that's a disincentive. So they've been able to develop a strain, identify a strain that is highly salt resistant, uh, can be easily milled, if not at all. And they're in the process of working with the University of Hanoi to transfer this to Vietnam. And the reason they're doing that is because of the high salinity levels in coastal areas over the time due to salt water intrusion, and also because the protein content in quinoa happens to be twice the protein content in rice. And finally, let's turn to Bangladesh a source of great innovation uh, in this area of our program as well as others. So Bangladesh has some 230 rivers, and the bulk of the populations live near these rivers, and they are very, very volatile, as you all know. And this is a picture of a river that's flooded, uh, brought with it tremendous destruction. And when the, when the river recedes, it leaves behind sandbars. And normally the sandbars are perceived as having no value because one is unclear about how long the sandbars are going to be there. Secondly, the salt content could be quite high. Thirdly, uh, there's not an adequate amount of soil mixed with sand. So it seems to be a harsh environment in which to grow crops. 
So an organization called Practical Action decided to challenge that idea, started to work with landless farmers, taught them how to move out on the sandbars that appear right after a storm, and how to plant crops that are cash crops that can come up very quickly, but also provide a critical health need in Bangladesh, namely high amounts of vitamin A, which are needed to counter childhood blindness. So the crop they chose is pumpkins. And this is a sandbar that previously had nothing on it. And the technology is very simple. It's basically taking people onto the sandbar, digging pits, having jute bags that are already filled with compost, which is usually pumpkin from a previous crop, putting seeds into the jute bag, dropping the jute bag into the hole, and then watering it periodically. The yields are impressive. They're getting up to 10 pumpkins per pit, and the weight of these pumpkins have been, to, been between 40 and 45 pounds. And the economics are equally impressive. So one farmer basically has invested $116 into this effort, has received $416 in return as a result of, of marketing almost 1,500 pumpkins in one season. The plan is to replicate this you know, throughout many, many parts of the Deltaic region and elsewhere in Bangladesh. And the hope is it provides opportunities for men and women as they themselves attempt to be lifted out of poverty and capitalize on such innovations. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you.